Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I am on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Morjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, Cultural Creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, my name is Patricia Keel, and this is Your Superior Self. I love it. Dr. Patricia Keel. Thank Reverend you. Doctor. Reverend, Reverend Doctor. Reverend Doctor. That's so <laughs> amazing. I've never, I have to tell you, at one before. point in my life, Trey, it was really important to be a reverend mm-hmm. because I thought I want to play with the big guys and they wouldn't let me play. And then once I became a reverend, I was like, Okay, now what's next? So it was that, whole, you know, that little mm-hmm. ego game we play that we just have to like, go for the next sort of becoming thing. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm a reverend doctor, it's like, eh, I'm a reverend doctor. <laughs> is it, but is there another level? I don't think there's another level that you can go to after doctor. It's not even a level. Doctor. It just meant I spent a lot of time with school and books, writing papers, discussing things. Mm-hmm. You well, know, how long did it take you to become a reverend? Oh, a long time. <laughs> yeah. I, I became a spiritual teacher in 1995, and that took me about five years, lots of travel. And then I started a church <laughs> in Berkeley, California. And once I started the church, then I started the journey to get to become ordained. And I became ordained. And so that whole process was another five years of being in that school. So that was 10 years of school. And then I did my doctorate with Matthew Fox. Mm. And that was another six years. So, you know, I'm overeducated. Plus, you know, I have like master's work and, you know, it's. I I love Matthew Fox's work, though. Oh, he's so amazing. He is, it was uh, it was an incredible incredible journey to work with Matt Fox because he's a real renegade. Yeah, he is. He is a re- renegade. I I have a couple of his books on. I don't, you not- know, Original Blessing was his first, but one of my favorites that I think not a lot of people know is a book called One River Many Wells, hmm. where he talks about this underlying river of consciousness you know, the divine presence, all that is, whatever you want to call it, and the many different wells that we can go down to find that consciousness. So it's Buddhism, Hinduism, shamanism, Zoroasterism, she, you know, seek all the different way, atheism, Hmm. that the river is there for all of us, but there are these different ways that we discover it. And then he brings, he kind of bridges the gaps and makes the connections between so many different spiritual traditions. It's a very cool book. Lots of poetry, lots of quotes. Sure. Well, what what book was there? Someone who like uh, initially kind of awakened you, or not even awakened, but kind of made you curious about spirituality or consciousness? Um, I think the fact that I was an alcoholic made me curious. Mm. Um. You know, that whole experience of being of trying to manage my life that was so out of control when I was in my 40s, you know, my relationship was out of my control, I was had already gone through one divorce was going through another one, and using alcohol to kind of manage my sense of inadequacy in the work that I was doing and the community I lived in. And um, when I look back on that now I kind of go, who was that woman? Like, it's so not who I am, but that's what catapulted me to actually go to a unity church with someone. And they had these very deep, quiet meditations where all of a sudden I just could begin to feel what was going on inside me. And that, that was the beginning of my journey. Really. It was catapulted out of that experience Mm -hmm. of so much suffering uh, in, in, trying to manage it with Chardonnay, basically. That was my coping me- mechanism. Mm. Unity Church. I don't know if um, a lot of people know what that is, or is that a divination of a... So, you know, I think, I think first of all, church gets a bad rap. 
I, I sometimes don't like to tell people I'm a minister because they immediately think I'm very pious and they shouldn't say things in front of me and that, you know, I'm that somehow you're a church lady. Um, but unity is a really interesting uh, movement in a way. It's like Matthew Fox's work is about a movement. The work I do in India is about a movement. It's not about a particular dogma, but rather unity is a metaphysical awareness of the teachings of Jesus. And everything that unity teaches is about the individual growth of each one of our souls, the journey of our soul. And it teaches it from the level of metaphysics. And when I say metaphysics, I mean that which is beyond the physical. So that in unity, for instance, when I do a unity talk, I just did one just this last weekend at a church. And I'm always talking about, even if we look at a Bible story, I'm always talking about, so who is that character? Who is Peter who tried to walk on water and he sank? Who is he in your life? You know, how does that represent the way we have faith for a moment and we think that things are going to happen and then we look down at what we think are the reality of the circumstance and we sink. So unity has just a beautiful kind of, for me, ever awareness in terms of awakening to who we are as spiritual beings having this human experience. Mm -hmm. And there are churches around, they're not very big, they're really small. And right now, a lot of them are just filled with old people because they don't know how to market, you know, they're old. And so it's really a shame because mm -hmm. the message is very alive in the world today, I believe, about mm -hmm. spiritual awakening, about moving into higher consciousness, which is who you are and what you're all about. Sure. But I mean, people feel uncomfortable, right? Because they've been indoctrinated with the old religion, you know, dogma and and you know everything's external of us right like god is external of us jesus is external of us it is the greatness that we search for is external of us it's not that message of it's inside of us right like the, the universe Absolutely. consciousness we are that right we are a fractal of the the universe here having this experience and that makes people uncomfortable it's almost, I remember, I remember this for myself. I remember even like having that aha moment of even like a, a, a resonating like awareness that I am a part of that, like feeling kind of like not good enough, right? Like, how can I be a part of that? I'm just a human. Like, I'm just tray downs. I have flaws. I've sinned. I've done all these things. And how can I be that pure of, consciousness to, you know does that make sense like it totally makes sense but where that is coming from is the collective consciousness i mean we live in this western collective consciousness the sort of christian sin-based consciousness that's why you know we were talking about matthew fox his book was original blessing that we are born as an original blessing and if you connect in with other spiritual traditions, like thinking, I mean, I'm very connected into India. I'm not in any way a Hindu. I do a lot of practices that come out of India because the Indian tradition, which is thousands and thousands of years old, is based in a knowing of who we are as a spiritual being that manif we manifest in this human form. It's a very different way. And the people in India reflect that in their culture, in the way they feel about themselves, in the way that they honor other people, in the way they honor nature and animals. Uh, it's our, I believe it's this Western culture that has this sin-based, you know, I'm not going to even go where, where it came from, but I think it's embedded in all of us. Even when we don't think we own it, it's still kind of in the background for us. Mm. It's hard to pull, it's very hard to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. And so, like you say, you feel you might feel a little guilty for feeling like, how could I be part of this incredible, expansive universe? But once you get it and you feel the joy of figuring out what your greatness is, like what your gift is that you have to give, you can't stop yourself from giving it. Sure. It's quite it's an energizing thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it feels it feels great to be. I don't know. I, when you, when you start communicating with that universe, when you start communicating with that communi um, consciousness, which you can, right? Like I say consciousness all the time. Like my wife's always like, Oh, you always say consciousness. That's like your buzzword. I, I can't say the other words that are like, they just it, like 
God is such a, um, it's such a, a, a it's loaded word. Yes. It's loaded. Totally so, like, loaded. I love, I love consciousness. I love, you know, the larger, I, I use what Tom, Tom Campbell calls the larger consciousness system because it just feels right to me, but we can communicate with that. And like, I've done, I've done a lot of that on my own as far as just like, you know, just you know, synchronicities. Right. And it's really shown me what, man, if you just start following, like, you know, just start taking chances and following your heart and doors will open that you never expected that they come out of left field. And it's just so like you talked about energizing because it, it shows me, you know, it doesn't prove anything, but it shows me, it supports the idea that we're greater than these, these human bodies. And, and it's so exciting. Um, and what, what is exciting is that you're a consciousness coach, which I've never heard of before. Yeah. Um, talk about that. Like, well, I'm with you. I mean, we live in a field of consciousness. Consciousness is the essence of who we are. We are consciousness. And there are many different levels of consciousness. It's, and, and I think that's an important thing for us to be aware of, because in everyday life, many of us are living in what I would call kind of a low vibe consciousness. We're, we're focused on people, places, and things. We anchor ourselves into what we think is a reality. We also have a lot of awareness of what might be underlying kind of what you could call subconscious, or it's hard to say unconscious, because if it's unconscious, you're not conscious of it. But there are a lot of things in our life that are being driven by that unconscious level of who we are. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have a higher consciousness. And that's the consciousness I think you're talking about that we can tap into in any moment. And it's a very, um, it's a very profound journey to make because my, my own personal experience and the experience of a lot of people that I've worked with is that we have a little taste of that higher consciousness. We have a taste of who we really are. We have a taste of our capacity to expand our awareness into a much greater field of possibilities in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we have a taste of that. And for some people, that that taste kind of whets the appetite and they move ahead and really begin to journey on the path that clearly has happened for you for other people we have a taste of it and and they shut down and they think that that can't really be their life or they strive to constantly go back to that same experience of higher consciousness they had you know a big vision or they had a dream that was anchored to a synchronicity. They had some sort of experience that gave them a sense of truth about that higher consciousness. What I know is though, it, it is a journey that we make and it's not a journey like this. Those of you who are listening won't see, but basically it's not a linear journey uphill. It's a, we go up to a certain stage and then we kind of come back down and we go up a little higher and we come back down. It's kind of one of those going to the mountaintop, but you go down to a valley every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And part of that is why working with people in consciousness, basically as a consciousness coach, I can really help people with practices that they can use to anchor themselves into higher consciousness, number one. And also one of the key things is to become aware of what our inner state is moment to moment, because we are either in a state of higher consciousness, we're either in a state of gratitude, of peacefulness, of calm, of, of in a state of flow in our life where whatever is happening around us, we can be fully present to it. Mm -hmm. Or we're in one of those other states, which we can label as a suffering state or a stressful state, or just not a state of flow. We can be in a state of anger, uh, stress, resentment, confusion, anxiety, you know, all those other things. Mm -hmm. What's happening for so many people is they're trying to expand their consciousness from a very low state of a, a low inner state. I won't say vibe state so much, but it's a low inner state. And they're not aware of how much they run those lower states. 
So learning how to become very aware of your state of consciousness moment to moment is almost the first step in working with moving into higher states of consciousness. And what ends up happening is, as you start having this awareness, oh, you know, I was just really feeling angry with my spouse. You start to notice what the consequences of that is, you know, in your own life. I'm going to stop here and see, you know, kind of what, I I don't want to just keep talking. I want to have a dialogue with you because that's way more fun. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you, like, what, like, how can we, be more aware that we're in those higher states of consciousness. Yeah, we, we you know, flow states, right? But, you know, Mikai Csikszentmihalyi, who was the, the father of flow, talks about when you're in these flow states, you don't realize you're in the flow state until after the flow state. But you know when you're not in the flow state. That is the key. <laughs> because most of us live in the not flow state most of the time, yeah. you know. And, and for what I've discovered in working with people is, we all have two or three kind of favorite suffering states. You know, people in your life who kind of run anger, right? No matter whatever it is, they're going to be angry about it, or they're going to find out what's wrong with the situation, right? Or you know, people who run an anxiety pattern, they're sort of worry, they're the worry warts. Or somebody who's got the resentment, you know, they're holding the black bag on their back of what somebody did to them 20 years ago. And everybody who comes in their life, they have to measure against that and whatever, be mm-hmm. abandoned, abandon them or do whatever. So we have this awareness and we be, the more we can become aware of what our inner kind of default, I would say, not beautiful states, stressful states, call them. Uh, the more we can be just tune in when they show up. We don't have to try to change them, but it's that awareness. That's a really big key. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Uh, I, it's slowly happening for me where I can kind of see the uh, conditioned um, emotional outbursts that I may have from a triggered state or something like that. Like where my body is just running from the program, the conscious, you know what I mean? Like, so um, just from my conditioning growing up and, and what I've been programmed to just from society alone, like to believe a certain thing, just because I've been programmed, like when I'm in a conversation and I start feeling those triggers, like I'm consciously becoming of those triggers now in my body. Um, and, uh, I'm trying, I'm working on healing those. I'm working on like feeling that, like going into the, those areas and seeing what it is that's there and why am I feeling a certain, a certain way about it, a certain topic or subject. Um, it's really helped me be present in a lot of conversations, like really fully present, if that makes sense. It totally does. And, and I want to just say one thing about that, because it is for some people, it's really important to pull apart and unwind the why and to go back to what the situation was and see the why. And for some people, they can unwind and pull that apart and let it go. For other people, if they unwind and get back there, they get stuck back there. And then everything becomes about, it, it, it creates kind of a little cover up for their bad behavior. Oh, I'm this way because my mother, you know, mm-hmm. because of my abandonment. So one of the things I've learned um, over, over a lot of years and, and going to India, I've been going to India now since 2006. So that's a lot of years. Um, And one of the things I've learned is that I can have awareness in the moment of a particular state that comes up, even without, for me right now, I don't even need to know exactly what the state is because like you say, you can feel in your body when you're feeling a little bit off. For me, it's just so, I'm so aware if I'm not in a calm, peaceful state that I feel it in the moment and I can just kind of, tune into myself and, and just be with that, be conscious of what's going on inside myself. Mm. Initially, I had to do a practice that I learned from my teachers in India to be able to disengage from that feeling. It's a very powerful three minute practice called the serene mind practice. And it literally, what happens is you don't have to go back and do the unravel you literally shift your awareness from one state of the brain, 
where that activity is, you know, the trigger activity for most of us is back there in the amygdala, you know, and it's activated stuff. It's activated the cortisol and stress hormones in the body. What we can do is we can shift our attention in a very short practice using the breath and using a visualization to a different area of the brain, which is called in India, it's called the Brahma Garba, <laughs> the Brahma Garba. It's right in the center. If you were to like, and if you want, we can go through the practice because it's really short, but I'm just sure. going to tell you what this is because people love the science of it as well. Mm -hmm. If you were to take up the point between the eyebrows at the third eye and bring a little light or flame back to the middle of your skull. So it would crisscross in the middle of your skull. That is where the pineal gland, the pituitary and the hypothalamus intersect. And it's a place inside the brain called the mid prefrontal cortex. And it's a place where new neural networks are formed. Mm -hmm. So when we do this three minute practice, what we're doing is we're moving out of whatever distressful kind of thought pattern we have. It might be something that we're thinking about from the past that we're kind of pulling forward into our mind. Uh, or we could be worrying about something in the future, but we're definitely not in the present when we're in those stressful states. So we move, we move out of the activity of the back of the brain of the amygdala, fight or flight, break that pattern and bring our awareness into this mid prefrontal cortex with a visualization. And you can't be in the focus of the two things at the same time. So what happens is it breaks that pattern and my experience of doing this practice and, and actually with, with clients that have done it, sometimes when you have a really stressful situation in your life, you know, and you just chew in on it, you, you know, you had that, like, there's somebody you, you'd want to talk to, but you don't want to talk to them and you're chewing on what you're going to say, you know, we all have those experiences or you're angry at your spouse and you just, you know, you just kind of, whatever it is. And it just keeps coming at you over and over throughout the day. Sometimes I had a friend and her husband was, had, had lost his job and they were living in this little apartment and she's trying to work. It's during COVID and he's watching dumb TV, you know, and wanting a sandwich. And she said, I had to do serene mind like six and seven times a day because I was just like, when is he going to get a job? Let me out of here. You know, all that kind of stuff just builds up inside. But ultimately, the, the chatter begins to stop because it's just about the monkey mind and you're moving out of those lower levels of consciousness, which we're talking about into a place of calm connection. And it's a calm connection with higher consciousness, with the consciousness of all that is. So yeah, let's do it. You want to do it? Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So I'm just going to lead you through it. Mm -hmm. I've already told you where we're going, the places. So take a moment, just close your eyes. If we were at my class, I'd probably put some real calm music on, but we'll just pretend. Mm -hmm. So I want you to take a nice, deep, conscious breath, inhaling through the nose and exhaling very slowly through the nose again. As you inhale deeply, slowly, slowly exhaling through the nose. And one more time, inhaling deeply and slowly exhaling through the nose. And now bring into your awareness one particular state that you have felt. It could be something you're feeling right now, any kind of inner stress you're feeling. Or just bring an example, if you're not feeling stressed, of something you felt today. And just notice where you're feeling it in the body. And if you can place a name to what that is. Is it anger, anxiety, confusion, fear, loneliness? Just become aware of the subtle quality of that inner state.
And now take a look at the thoughts that bring this state into your awareness. Are the thoughts coming from the past? Are you carrying past thoughts, experiences, and bringing them into your present moment? Or is this state caused by a concern for the future? Are your thoughts way out in the future? Or are you in the present moment? No need to change, just simply be aware. And now bring your awareness to that space between the eyebrows. And gently see a small flame or a light beam situated right between the eyebrows. And gently now bring that tiny flame or that bright light into the center of your head, pulling it right back from the center of the eyebrows. And just be with the flame or the light in the center of your skull for a minute and taking another deep and conscious breath as you exhale, gently open your eyes. Hmm. I love it. It's a beautiful practice. And you might not have been feeling stress when we started. So I didn't want to plant something juicy <laughs> in your head. But, you know, for people who do have, which is most of people, you know, they have anxiety throughout the day. It's a really mm -hmm. beautiful practice. You sure. know, and, I was feeling got, uh, fired up today. I was feeling um, just very motivated. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was remembering that, you know, and just excited for where my future, is, you know, where I'm going, right? The path. I don't awesome. know where I'm going, but uh, you know, I'm I'm excited to just take a leap of faith and trust the universe is gonna is pushing me, right? Or or guiding me, um, pulling me. Um, both. both. Hey, you know. I want to say, can I say something about that? Sure. Because one of the questions that you gave me was, what's my favorite book? Mm -hmm. And the first book that came into my mind is this book. And you can see it's well-worn. It's called Lessons in Truth. And it was written by a woman who's a homeopath. Her name is Emily Cady, C-A-D-Y. And she wrote the book in the eight, she's, she lived in the 1800s. So it's a really, it's really an old message. But the reason I bring it up is because there, there's a whole section in this book on faith, that when I read this, I it anchored something in my mind, and I think in my heart that has stayed with me for, you know, over 30 years, because I read it over 30 years ago, and I've been teaching it over, you know, for a lot. Mm -hmm. And what she said was, she said, whenever we have a desire in our heart, we feel something that's coming in our heart. And she even uses this idea that desire means out from the father. So it's like coming from consciousness. Mm -hmm. Whenever we feel something coming to us, like this impulse that we get, we wouldn't be able to feel it if it weren't already on its way to us out of the mind and the heart of the divine consciousness. You know, really? it, otherwise you couldn't feel it. If it mm -hmm. wasn't already yours, it wouldn't be on your radar. It's mm -hmm. like your radar, my radar is different stuff coming in. And I just thought that was like such a powerful anchoring for people to understand the greatness that is within each one of us and how uniquely we are made to be able to carry out things that are only ours to express and to really bring to consciousness, bring out into the world. Anyway, so I love that piece in the book. The other little thing that I totally love, and I, because you use the word faith, so I'm just kind of riffing off your words here, yeah, sure. is this, 
this definition of faith that Charles Fillmore, who was the co-founder of Unity with his wife, who had a massive healing. Anyway, lots of cool stuff there. But he says, faith is the perceiving power of the mind linked with the power to shape substance. So again, it's like, like, what can I carry in my consciousness? When he says perceiving power of the mind, to me, that's consciousness. And consciousness is not just the brain. Consciousness is the heart too, because mm. the heart has an incredible, the brain of the heart is almost as powerful as the brain of the mind. I mean, they know that. And there's lots of research we could talk about that. But so faith is this, the perceiving power of our consciousness, and it's linked with this energetic power to shape substance, you know, to make cell phones, <laughs> to create podcasts, mm -hmm. to take ideas and bring them out into form, to speak words and create transformation in consciousness. And kind of those two things for me, they anchored my journey 30 years ago uh, in a way that I think continues to anchor who I am today and how I show up in the world, you know, even though I do a lot more with Indian practices and breath practices and pranayamas and, you know, a lot of other sort of esoteric stuff, that kind of deep knowing about who each one of us is and who we came to be in the world um, and unpack for the world is just an extraordinary it just gives me a lot of joy. <laughs> sure. Well, what do you feel when you're tapping into that, right? When that, in that higher self or the higher consciousness, like what are you feeling and what is it pulling out of you? A lot of joy. <laughs> a lot of joy. I, you know, I, I've had, I've had some pretty incredible experiences. I, I, I got awakened in India in 2012. My awakening date was 12, 12, 12, which was you know, in, in and of itself, pretty cool. And they put me in a, in a dark room for three days. They told me to come to India. They said, you're going to be awakened on 12, 12, 12. They put me in this room on 12, 11, took me out on 12, 13. And on 12, 12, 12, my mind went blank. And that was like, uh, you know, it'll be 10 years in December. And since then, I've just had so many different experiences of this um, this connection to a different level of consciousness, yes, but also a, a sense of deep peace inside myself, but peace in a um, in an everyday way, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, not just like peace sitting on your cushion and you're meditating and you feel really great, but peace being able to be in a relationship that's challenging, or peace being around you know, somebody who's dying. I mean, I do vigil volunteering. I, vol I volunteer to be with people who are dying because to me, it's a great gift to hold that space for them. Mm -hmm. You know, peace and relationship with crazy things that are happening in the sense that it doesn't pull me off my, you know, yeah, my yeah. keel. <laughs> and that to me has been the gift of this awakening experience. And it keeps, it just keeps expanding. Plus sure. there's a lot of joy there's a lot of laughter for no reason. And well, let me ask you this, right? So who, who are they that predicted this, this date? And Oh, Oh, Oh. So I've, I've been going to India um, and going to a place called was originally called oneness university. It's now called Akam, which means I am you, you are me. We are one. It basically is about oneness. E K A M is oneness. And I've been going there since 2006, taking classes. I used to bring groups of people there uh, to study. And now I do events here in the U.S. I used to travel around and give a, a, a blessing through my eyes. Um, and they have a group of very people in really high states of consciousness who um, kind of tune into who you are. <laughs> And they, I was doing this, this um, esoteric practice through the eyes called a oneness meditation. And, and that's when they called me to come in and have this experience. Um, this particular organization has a massive vision, and that is to awaken 74,000. Now it's more like 80,000 80, people globally to awaken 80,000 people, to move people into enlightenment so that we can save the planet, so that we're mm -hmm. all living in higher consciousness states. Mm -hmm. And so they're take, teaching classes all the time. I mean, I do a morning meditation every morning, Monday through Friday with people and just to help people 
anchor their day. You know, it's a totally free thing to do. They, te- they have free events that people can participate in. And then they have events in India now that is India's open. Uh, they have a peace festival. They have enlightenment festivals. They have um, a yoga challenge that's coming up that mm-hmm. all of these things now happening online as well as in India. But it's been a beautiful gift for me to be part of the community. It's that's very awesome. global. That's, yeah. That's there are people from all over the world that have become my friends. So yeah. um, these, these individuals of higher consciousness say, all right, you're going to have an awakening on this date. Um, but you said your mind went blank, right? Like, can you unpack that at all? Can you, and, and, yes. <laughs> like, I, I really like, like, I really want to know more about this. Like, you know, I know some states are ineffable, right? Like you can't really describe it and put it in human terms. Um, but please, please try. <laughs> okay. Well, so what I can tell you is about what my experience was when I was there, because I was in a dark room. So, you know, it was, there were two beds and there was a yoga mat in between and a little altar. And one of those ubiquitous plastic chairs that everybody has all over the world that you can buy at Walmart. <clears throat> and because it was all dark, I was very conscious of what was going on inside me because there's nobody to talk to for three days. <clears throat> I also was aware that this day was the, the day, you know, it was like the, the middle day of when I'm there. I kind of knew I'd been there for a day. And I was sitting, I was sitting on the mat in front of this little altar. And all of a sudden I had this experience tray. It was so bizarre. It was like somebody had taken like a laser and gone right around the top of my head and just the top of my head just came off. Mm. And I, 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 like a witness, I mean, because I didn't move my head, I looked inside my head and there was nothing there. It was like, I was looking in there going, there, there's no thought in there. Where, where is it? Mm-hmm. That was the experience that I had. And it stayed with me for a long time while I was in the space of just not thinking about anything. And then of course, thoughts start coming. It's not like it was a permanent thing at all when I had that first experience. Um, But over time, and after going there many, many times, I've had extraordinary experiences where I've been in a place of awareness with maybe a teacher talking or being in a group doing some chanting or doing some sort of a process And all of a sudden, um, my body was not my body anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't control the way I would be able to walk. And I would literally be outside of the senses of my body um, without any thought activity going on. It's, it's just kind of hard to explain. But are you still Um, you though? Are you still your awareness? I can't say when I'm in it if I'm there or not, because, mm-hmm. it, you know, when you're in it, you're not necessarily aware, you're aware after, the, for me, I'm aware after the fact, or like the experiences that I've had in India, oftentimes, I remember little snippets of somebody helping me walk, or some little thing that I see, or, you know, but that those experiences, I would say, are not, they're not the normal thing that somebody who is awakened or enlightened has. Those are awakened experiences where we, you go into like a high state where the senses disconnect and you're, you know, you're, you're really in this flow, but they're not functional. They're not functional states. What I've been experiencing maybe in the past two and a half, three years, has been a much more grounded, much more functional state. And it's been, you know, I can't, I'm not enlightened. I know I'm, you know, I have experiences of awakening. I'm in a nice experience of not being attached to outcomes. I'm not nervous about things that I'm called to do. I, um, you know, those things that used to be part of my life aren't part of my life anymore. So I know how different that is. That's, Mm -hmm. that's what I can say about that. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, no, but, but it's kind it's, of a hard question it to is answer. A hard, it's a hard yeah. question. So like, because people, for everybody it's different, you know, yeah. it's so different. Mm-hmm. Like some people have out of body experiences, right. Where they feel they have that their, their same personality and they're able to, to travel long, long distances and, and see different things, but it, but still see the body. And I didn't know if that was like that for you. No, I, I'm not having that kind of thing at all. No, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I feel like, I, and even on my website, I, the under sort of underlying thing under patriciakill.com is everyday awakening, because I feel like people, people need to know that there's, there's freedom from the prison that we live in, the prison of the mind that kind of keeps us like my friend calls it mind jail. You know, that sort of monkey mind. She said, you're in mind jail. You know, mm-hmm. there's a freedom from that that allows us to live our life the way we thought we were going to live it, which is from a place of loving connection, a place of joy with our family and our kids, loving the work that we do, you know, eating healthy food, that that is all possible. And it's only possible when our inner state has a sense of freedom about where it lives, you know, Mm -hmm. that it's not attached or totally detached, that there's just a flow going on. Mm -hmm. And that's been my experience. It's been really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Has any of this like improved, like given you like um, what they consider um, like cities that I think the Indian culture calls cities or something similar to that? um, So so that was one of the pieces in, in a course that I've been taking for a number of years was, was getting, the, you know, having cities. And in a sense, the, the eye, eye blessing, the eye diksha thing that I was doing as a city, uh, the, the, there's a transmission that comes through the hands that is like a city. There's different cities that are coming. When I go back to India, which hopefully won't be too far from now, I haven't been because of COVID, and now they're just opening it up that's part of the experience for the next time I go back to India is to, to receive some more CDs. Um, but yeah, that's definitely mm-hmm. part of the process, but you know, I have to say, I'm not, that's not a craving that I have for myself. I know mm-hmm. some people would, I would like to buy locate. I think that would be really cool, you know, <laughs> but, um, and I, you know, I know friends who have friends who buy locate, they're not, they're Indians, but but um, beyond that, I don't, I don't have a craving for any of it. I just, mm-hmm. I feel it flowing in my life. And the more it happens for me, the more my presence impacts the people that I teach, my clients, just my family. And for me, that's where the juice is. You know, it's being, sure. it's being in service in that way in the world, because that's what, that's what I'm called into. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I, for me, it's more or less like, um, like really finding out like who we are in this universe um, and, and connecting more with, with that, you know, with the, the higher source of consciousness and, and like strengthening that bond uh, that, you know, and coming into that um, and, and really, and showing others that we're capable of doing these things. Right. And getting out of this, um, this program, right. Like it's kind of like the matrix, you know, you take that yeah. pill and you, you awaken to what's, you know, you, you awaken to what really it is. It's a drama. And like, you know, you're, you're playing a, a character in this role and it's like, um, but you know, you, you make a decision and you're like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to totally be something different and I'm going to consciously live my life in this way and not be bothered by what society says I need to be bothered by, you know, like, and find there's freedom in that and, and freeing yourself from the monkey mind and freeing yourself from the personality of the ego. I mean, like, look, look I am, I am a, a fractal of the universe of consciousness, right? And I have this personality that is, that is identified here in this reality as Trey. I, I'm playing a part. Um, there's nothing wrong with being Trey. There is a, there is a, there is peace in knowing that that is a personality and I can see the traits. I can see, my um my triggers i can see my tendencies and i know that i have to work on a lot uh, i know there's a shadow i know that there are things that i'm unconscious to because i react uh in fight or flight to certain things in a certain what way. do you react to um mm, i react to it depends on the situation right um like for instance um 
my 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 kid my son the other day was was he's such a, a gentle child and and he's so sensitive but he, him and his sister got into a fight and um like he kicked her in the stomach and she was gasping for air and you know he's he's really didn't mean to do it but he just he reacted so like and immediately i feel this rage inside of me right like and i start going you know towards him and i grab him by his shirt and i'm like hold up oh this is exactly what my dad did to me right like this is exactly i'm reliving that and it's it's in the body that stress that trauma the trauma the the sensitivity to that but being consciously aware of that and and but there's so much in our bodies that we're unconscious to. There's so much, there's so much that needs to be healed there. I mean, you talk about ancestral healing, you talk about epigenetics. There's so much there that is stress for my great, great, great grandfather, my great, great grand grandmother. Like it's all there just waiting for a moment to come out, you know, just from activation. But you can be, it, it's all about awareness. Yeah, exactly. Know? That's So, that's so exactly here's right. the thing, you know, one of the things that, that I've kind of been working with, with people who have kids is it's really challenging because like you say, those old family patterns pop into us, the parent, we're the parent now. And we're like, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the, the key thing that as parents that we, that we really must do. And especially now, because kids are just, I don't even know how kids can be kids. I just think it's gotta be so hard. I have three grandchildren and I just, you know, I, I, I look at them and I think this is a challenging world you're growing up into. But to, to be a parent today, the greatest gift we can give our children is to feel into them, is to feel them and to take the attention away from ourselves, which is where we always go. You know, it's my anger or my control or I'm the good parent and this is how you should act. And to feel into what is that child feeling in this moment? Mm -hmm. Because that's all they really need. They need that sort of compassion of the heart to be felt for them to stop whatever kind of, and it sounds like in your son's case, he didn't even mean to do this. He wasn't like trying to re, you know, be mad at his sister. It was just an accident. But that whole thing of shifting the trigger from this is who I am as the parent and how I need to show up to focus immediately on a child and, oh, that must have been really hard for you. I know you didn't, you know, feeling into that. It's mm -hmm. a big shift for us because, and, and I'm not pinpointing you, Trey, this is like all of us, we are, we are obsessed with our own kind of with me. It's all about me all the time. I want to, you know, I want to be feeling good with my partner. I want to feel good with my kids. I want to know they like me. I mean, it's, we are obsessed with ourselves. Sure. And, and part of, part of the experience of transformation and awakening is to be conscious, of, first of all, of those states and those things that, that disrupt us, like your triggers or whatever you call it, a charge or a trigger. And then to have awareness about what our inner state is, and then to have awareness and what are the consequences of that inner state I'm holding. So we move out of that self-centered nature that kind of we can wallow in our own inner, it's all about me thing. It's really quite, mm -hmm. it's quite a, um, it's a journey, you know, it is it's a journey. a journey and it just, we keep catching ourselves over and over and then you know, we stop putting responsibility on anyone else. It just becomes, this is part of my journey is to become more and more aware of what my triggers are and mm -hmm. to not let them trip me up in the relationships that I love or in the work that I'm called to do in the world. You sure. know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like, you know, the, the, what you're, what I'm hearing from you is being more empathetic, right. Being um, empathy, right. Like in really feeling, the other person's suffering and other person's uh, moment of weakness, whatever that may be. Um, for me, I have moments of that for other people. Like I can see when I see people interact with someone and, and they're in a, a, in a, in they're in their own suffering. Like I can feel it and I can just kind of curi curiosity hits me and, and I start thinking about, well, what is it that they're experiencing now and why are they experiencing that? Is it something from their childhood, their past? Is it ancestral? Is it, what is that? But see, you're going into your mind. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. you there. 
I'm going to be a coach for you there because that is not the same thing as having compassion for someone because already when we're trying to ask why it's happening, there's a little inner judge that's going on, you know, rather than just simply feeling into what they're feeling, they're feeling sad, they're feeling without trying to analyze why they're feeling it because that's really all that people need. They need that. It's, it's, it's that Taurus field around the heart, you know, have you, mm-hmm. you've probably heard about that. I mean, heart math talks about that. I don't know if you've got heart math people coming on, but that would be a great thing for you. There's this Taurus field energetically three feet out from us that the energy of our heart, the electromagnetic energy from my heart goes out three feet and your heart goes out three feet and the person that you're with their energy is coming out three feet. And so if we can feel into what they're feeling, not by saying I need to be depressed because they're depressed, but rather just have that awareness of what they're feeling, the state that you have, which could be higher consciousness, a calm presence, a loving presence that then begins to wash over that person because they feel the connection. It's Mm -hmm. a, it's, it's, such a beautiful kind of awareness to have. And it's beyond the mind. It's beyond the reasons it's, it's, it's very, it's consciousness, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the flowering of the heart that brings us into a state of connection with other human beings. Sure. Yeah. 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 I I mean, I feel it first in my heart. Right. And then the intellect comes in and it's like, well, what is that? Because you're smart. I wouldn't say that. I just, uh, well, I think, I think you are <laughs> go for it. Um, oh, I appreciate that. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, the, I've, I've been more conscious of my heart since, since I wouldn't say I'm enlightened. I wouldn't say, I, I would say that I am awakening to new ideals, new ideas, no, new ideas, new feelings in my body. The heart is where I feel it the most. Like I'm feeling new, I'm feeling new feelings in my heart that I've never felt before. Cause I think I was, I was, I had a hardened heart. You know, I, 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 it was crusted over because of fear of feeling because we live in a society, especially for males, that uh, any emotions are are weakness. You know, I didn't want to show how I was feeling, I didn't want to show people the softer side of me i felt like i had to live a lot of my ego and um you know i was very um quick to put you in your place if you made me feel uh, you know hurt right and the more that um i live in my heart the more that i feel like i i i mean it doesn't take much for me to to really shed a tear right and i'm learning to be more open about that as well like just beautiful just in, especially in front of my family like just really like even my wife right like i used to you know i i i tell like i would you know hold back a lot of my emotions especially like you know during movies or something like because i didn't want to like it, i'm like resisting i'm like I, I, I can't let her see this you know and now, oh my god <laughs> and she and now that you do she probably loves it because she well, married I, that I, I'm person. slowly allowing her to see it, but it's because it's still there, but I feel it more. And I feel it like during these conversations and like, really it is, it is the path. It, it is really truly my compass in, in this entire experience. It's so beautiful that you're feeling this because this is how you are going to get your message across to people. You know, this is, we can read the books and we can talk about ideas and, and concepts are wonderful because they sort of lead, they lead us along the path, but it's the actual experience that we have. And it's a full body experience. And the heart is the heart is it. It's, you know, there's a great, there's a great, um, I'm after we get off, I'm going to send you some things for you to take a look at, but there's a really just a, a very um, easy way to activate the heart more. Each of the chakras has what's known as a beige mantra and a beige is like the seed mantra for that particular region. And the beige mantra for the heart is L-A-N, L-A-N-G, is long. So anytime you feel you want to just expand the heart a little bit, you can just close your eyes and take a deep inhalation and then chant the long. You want to do it with me once? Sure. L-A-N-G. So I invite you to close your eyes. 
Take a deep L-A-N-G. breath. L-A-N-G. Long. 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 You know, the G is not, it's not like long. It's long. So it <laughs> kind of catches in your throat. Mm-hmm. Mm. I could feel it there for sure. Yeah. It's the vibration for the heart. There's one for each of the chakras. Anyway. Wow. Yeah. There's so many fun things to play with, but you're a heart man. I got it for you. I can see it. I can <laughs> see it. <laughs> I'm a hard guy. And, and heart math, if you haven't looked up heart math, hmm. it, it's, they have some amazing tools to help people to learn to have coherence in their heart. They look at the electromagnetic energies of the heart. And when we're in stressful states, it's a very chaotic pattern. And when we are in a state of peace and presence of gratitude, of grace, of love, there's a very synchronistic kind of coherent pattern that shows up as the electromagnetic energy of the heart. And it matches the electromagnetic magnetic energy in the earth. And they're doing, they do tests and you can wear these monitors and you can monitor, you know, your own heart coherence and how it impacts other people. But they're doing this really cool project where they're putting monitors on trees um, I have a friend in Southern California and she lives in the redwoods and they're putting a big monitor on this redwood in front of her house because they're looking to see the electromagnetic energy of the redwoods as it relates to the environment around them and how it impacts the earth. Mm. Super amazing. That is amazing. Wow. I've loved this entire conversation. So Dr. Rev, Rev doctor, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you? How can they find out more about you? Oh, cool. Um, you can go to my website, which is, I've got a bunch of them, but Patricia Keel, like the bottom of a boat, P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-K-E-E-L.com. You could join me. There's information about my previous radio shows. I did radio show, the one that's program. You listen to those, my podcast, Relationship Fix. You can join us for free Sunday morning, uh, Monday through Friday eight o'clock Pacific time for meditation. And um, if anybody wants to do a, a free session with me, I'd love to do a free session with anybody. You can see on there, there's a place to click, click and check me out. Awesome. So, so much fun to be with you, Trey. I love every second of this. Thank you. So I much can't for wait to continue to get to know you. Where do you <laughs> live, by the way, if that's okay I, to ask you? That's fine. I'm in Baltimore. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. And, yeah, and they're, you're they're in people. Cali. Are you in Cali? Are you in West? West I live in Northern West? California, just North of San Francisco, okay, cool. Mar Marin County, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. So oh, nice. But my mother is born and bred in Aberdeen, Maryland. Oh, so I, yeah, but she grew up on a farm there. So I, you know, I, um, I used to go there as a kid. Yeah. I like oh. Maryland. Baltimore's nice. Baltimore really nice. Is nice. Yeah, yeah. hon. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks so much. It's been great to be with you. Let me know when the show's on because I'll post it out on my to my peeps and let them know more about your show.